Hi everybody, Dr. Z here. You did it. This is the last video of the French Revolution. We're gonna talk about Napoleon. So Napoleon Bonaparte is a famous military leader. Um, he rose to prominence during the French Revolution. Um, as you remember, those revolutionary armies were, were really key um, at the time. And he led several successful campaigns. He became a national hero by age 26. Uh, he was born in Corsica to a modest noble family. Um, so he's a member of the nobility, but he didn't come from a lot of means. And he really believed in hard work and, you know, working his way up in, through in the military. Um, he had famous military ex expeditions to Egypt that catapulted him into political power. Um, all of the Egyptian holdings, by the way, uh, at the Louvre Museum in Paris, a lot of them were pillaged by his troops. Um, and that, that's been kind of a bone of contention between the Egyptians and the, and the French. Um, and upon his return, when he came back from Egypt, he came back to a republic that was bankrupt. The directory was unpopular with the people, um, and he really sort of was in the right place at the right time. Because he had so many people behind him, right? He was able to overthrow the directory in seventeen eight and sorry, seventeen ninety-nine. Um, so he closed down the Council of Five Hundred, he ousted those five directors, um, and he was named the first consul of the Republic for ten years. Um, this is a very Roman sounding thing, and that's on purpose, right? So Napoleon historians tend to think about men like Charlemagne and Napoleon and even later on Adolf Hitler um, and certainly Mussolini as people who were lusting after the glories of the Roman Empire um, and really trying to rebuild that Roman uh, Empire in Europe. Um, and so he's he is, you know, taking on that word consul um, directly from the Roman Republic. He rewrites the constitution, legalizing his coup. Um, and he says, hey, let's, you know, let's have a referendum to a plebiscite to make sure everyone approves of what I did. And people vote 3 million to 1500 uh, to support his succession to rule. Um, so they basically voted in an emperor. Um, and so his new constitution, makes France look like a republic, right? And we have to remember he's called, he calls himself consul, okay? Uh, but in reality, it is a dictatorship. Um, he forms the Bank of France. He signs what's called the Concordat with the Pope, um, giving back the church many, a lot of its rights. However, he continues to control the church um, and uh, both economically and with who is going to be in power. So the church doesn't have full free rights once again in France. He grants amnesty to all the nobles who left. So he says, hey, all you emigres, come on back. Um, I'm going to create a new imperial nobility. Um, and he also creates a legal code. So Napoleon is a very sort of what's the word I'm looking for? Like people look at him in different ways, right? So some people think he was a good emperor who upheld the ideals of the revolution. Some people see him as a dictator uh, who took over all of Europe. Um, so it's really up to you to decide. One of his lasting legacies is the Napoleonic Code. Um, he declared that all men were equal before the law. So he upholds that idea in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. He also secures wealth and private property. A lot of the Napoleonic Code is the is the foundation of European codes of law today. Um, so a lot of his laws survive today. Um, and this is a huge legacy that he left behind. Of course, in those laws, women lost some of their freedoms that they had gained in the revolution. Um, so they became dependents of their fathers. They could not, or husbands, they couldn't make contracts. They couldn't have bank accounts. He also curtailed free speech and freedom of the press for all. So Napoleonic Code, again, right? Is it progressive or is it not? Um, Napoleon and his armies go and they take over most of Europe. And you can see with the red line here, um, the extent of his reach um, and how he really did create a new European empire. There were assassination attempts that led him to believe that he needed to create a new Roman empire in Europe. Um, so he went after Italy, the German lands, the Dutch Republic, uh, the West Bank of the Rhine. He defeated his uh, Lord Nelson in a naval battle. Um, this was a big deal at the time. The 
one of the things that he does, and I'm just going to uh, skip over to this slide really quickly here, is he crowns himself as emperor, right? So because because he controls, even though he signed the Concord mm -hmm. at um, making the relationship between the French state and the Roman Catholic Church a little bit better, he still controls the Roman Catholic Church. So he takes the crown, right, crowns himself, and he places the crown on Josephine, his um, girlfriend, partner, you know, whatever you want to call her, um, right, uh, to make her the empress as well. This was a symbolic gesture. He is not taking power from the Pope, right? He, uh, or sorry, he is taking power from the Pope, right? He's putting the crown on the head himself. The Pope is not putting the crown on his head. You see the Pope sort of standing in the background here with the little hat on. Um, and Napoleon here is holding the crown, right, for him, for himself. Um, so he also then defeats the Russians, Swedes, Austrians, and, and a French coalition at the Battle of Austerlitz. Um, and he abolishes the Holy Roman Empire, establishes the German Confederation of the Rhine. He names himself a protector of these 15 German states. And Prussia lost half of its population, and Russia accepted Napoleon's domination in Europe. So overall, right, um, he's, you know, he sees a lot of success, but this success comes to an end. Um, one of his big mistakes, and Adolf Hitler sort of did the exact same thing about 100 years later, was that he decided to go into Russia in the middle of the winter, right? So he didn't plan for those cold, cold Russian winters, and he was defeated in Russia. Um, but that wasn't the end of Napoleon. Um, so he creates what's called the continental system, okay? So what this says is basically who can trade with whom, and it bans Great Britain and her colonies from docking at French ports. So this starts to change the merits of mercantilism, right, and who is uh, making more money, um, which European powers are making more money. He's trying basically to ha wage an economic war against Britain. Um, the French rule across the continent sparks reactive nationalism. So people all over Europe, one of the main causes of European nations and nationalism, the growth of nations, is a reaction to Napoleon's dominance. Um, so as we're going to see when we get into January, February, we're going to start to understand in the 19th century how European nations like Germany and Italy emerged um, in the time after Napoleon. And this is one of the ways that Europe starts to really see, ah, we need to move to nations, right? It starts with the peace of Westphalia, right? But Napoleon is a big cause of that as well. Um, the British are going to counter blockade Napoleon to try to wage that economic war against him as well. Um, he's defeated in Russia. In March of 1814, there's the Treaty of Chaumont, and this is Austria, Prussia, Russia, and Great Britain that are uniting to defeat him once again. Um, and a war of liberation is declared across Europe against Napoleon. So basically all of the European monarchs rise up and say, we are going to unite against you. Um, and by April 4th, 1814, he abdicates his throne. He goes and he ex is exiled uh, to the island of Elba, which is um, off the coast of Tuscany in Italy. This starts what is called the Bourbon Restoration. It's the restoration of a monarchy, right? Europe is trying, France is trying to just reestablish itself, right? As a monarchy saying, okay, let's forget about the revolution, right? We're going to have um, now Louis the 18th on, on the throne, um, but we're going to be a constitutional monarch um, in this period of restoration, uh, granting some civil, liber civil liberties. Um, but then Napoleon leaves Elba. He sort of spends one last campaign um, trying to reinstate himself. Uh, Louis XVIII is going to flee when Napoleon marches on Paris. Um, and there's 100 days of fighting. And finally, the European monarchs defeat Napoleon at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. And this is the real end to Napoleon. And they say, look, you have to be exiled, not to any place near Europe, but to St. Helena's way off in the Atlantic Ocean where you can't come back and you can't um, exert any of your power. Napoleon, I believe, gets cancer on St. Helena's. He dies there after writing his memoirs. 
So with all of this, we have to think, well, what are some of the outcomes, right? In the French Revolution, we have the development of the right and the left politically, right? Um, the French Revolution helps us understand the imperfections of democracy. We see all of that played out in the French Revolution with how mired in debate, even from the beginning at the Estates General with the vote by head or vote by estate, right? That, that deadlock can happen and that um, legislative governments are often slow and you know it's very difficult to get lots of people to agree on things and it can be very attractive to see um a strong military leader like napoleon right come into come into power or mussolini or hitler right um it helps us understand when people get tired of democracies why they move towards authoritarianism um, Napoleon's legacy, of course, includes the Napoleonic legal code. Um, he also brought about a France that was centered on the French instead of the king, right? Sorry, not Napoleon, but the French Revolution. The French Revolution brings about a France that's centered on the French rather than the king. Um, and that's huge. That's, you know, in when we think about nations, nationalism, what nations mean, um, in many ways, this is sort of the Hobbesian understanding that the people make up the state. Um, the people, you know, he, Hobbes saw people making up the king, right, and giving the king sovereignty. But if we take the king out of the question, then it's really the people making up the state. Um, and then, of course, the people reevaluating the role of the church and the state in their lives, right? And that that relationship with the Catholic Church is going to be a tenuous one. Um, not only for France, but also for Italy. And we'll, we'll talk about that when Mussolini comes into power and, and what happens. Um, but it's really something else that, you know, this, when we think about this, because if, if this class has been anything, it's been a history of the Catholic Church through the last 300 or so years, right? And we see that that changed quite a bit. All right. Uh, I look forward to our discussions in class. Have a wonderful day. You are done. You did it. French Revolution and Napoleon. Good job.